listening to Catholic Chicago on WNDZ 750 AM. During the next hour, the Archdiocese of Chicago brings you programs about the people, events, and issues that touch our lives. Welcome to Catholic Chicago. Good morning. Welcome to Catholic Chicago on WNDZ, 7.50 a.m. Father Greg Sackowitz, the rector of William Cathedral, co-hosting Mark Teresi, assistant to the rector, which happens to be me, for plan development at Cathedral. How are you, Mark? Good morning. Very good. At 45 degrees, but a beautiful drive in. The sun is over the lake and just one of those beautiful fall days. Beautiful fall Monday. And by the way, today, history in the making Thanks to the Department of Radio and Television with Vince Girasoli and Michael May and Brian Brock and Javier Garcia. We are live streaming, first time ever. So we are socially distanced from each other, we masks are. included. And this is a brand new beginning. So our phone number, 312-255-8408, 312-255-8408. A tremendous program lined up. Three tremendous priests. There's Diocese of Chicago yep. have been elected or named Bishop Elects for the Archdiocese. There are Father Jeff Grab, Father Bob Lombardo, and Father Kevin Birmingham. We're going to have each one of them for 20 minutes on the program this morning. I think so to kick it off will be Father Jeff Grab. Are you with us, Jeff? Yes, I am. Good morning, Father Greg. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. Congratulations. Father Thank Jeff Grab, congratulations. I have to ask the first question, and that is, where were you, and who gave you a call when that moment happened? <laughs> Actually, I, my mother and I were up home uh, in Madison. We're originally from a small town just west of Madison, and spending a couple days uh, over the Labor Day weekend. And so it was bright and early on Sunday morning, uh, September 6th, uh, a morning I will never forget. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was 6 a.m., and my cell phone rang. And, At 6 o'clock well, in the morning? Bright and early, bright and early. Well, the uh, our, our nuncio, apostolic nuncio, uh, Archbishop Christo Christophe Pierre, was uh, on holiday himself um, in Paris visiting family, and so he was making calls from there. And so it was a it was a bright. Well, for him it was the afternoon. For us it was bright first thing early. in the morning. What yeah. was your mom's reaction? Well, I mean, the, the greatest challenge you... was. It was to not be able to to share the news oh, immediately. You, oh, you couldn't um, say anything. And, um, and so uh, it was uh, even just for myself because you 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 receive this news and you say yes to something uh, that's going to change your life, mm -hmm. um, and then you can't talk about it until it's announced. You now, know, Jeff, I have to and, ask this question: When the phone rang at six o'clock in the morning, did you at first? think about not picking it up because you thought it was a, a prank call or who's calling me at six o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning? Uh, to be honest, it was more of a concern, yeah. you know, in a sense, because I, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, uh, the, the over concern of, uh oh, you know, an early morning call, this probably isn't True. good news, you yeah. know, and so <laughs> that was kind of, you know, but uh, it ended up being very transformative news. Now, other priests who have received the phone call that we've been on the phone with in the past years have said, when he would call, they thought it was somebody calling as a prank. Yeah, one of their classmates. Their classmates putting him up to it. And so when you got the phone call and he announced who he was, I'm assuming from the very first moment you knew this was not a joke. Correct. Uh, and just for the simple fact that I happened to, for, without, because of other dealings with my work downtown, I had uh, Archbishop uh, uh, Pierre's... Um, contact information in my cell phone so his name came up on caller id oh it did oh and so um i knew okay well either this is you know there was some issue or you know problem perhaps back here because i was out of town 
and as judicial vicar, you know, sometimes you have to deal with, you know, different challenges and problems. And um, but it was it was a very different it was a very different call. So I have to ask you, he says, hello, how are you doing? You know, the talk <laughs> back and forth. Then what did he we were expecting maybe a problem, as you just mentioned. What were his words to you? Um, just that uh, he has some very good news to share, and that the Holy Father um, has uh, elected me to be a, an auxiliary bishop in Chicago. And what was your What was your very first reaction in your mind? <laughs> <laughs> very surreal. <laughs> um, it, it just I, I think a million thoughts. I, I don't think I could have gotten another thought in my mind if I tried. <laughs> yeah, in a sense, it was just this. It was almost like. It, and not, and not a dying scene, but a sense of, you know, you hear your whole life flashes in front of your eyes. Cause it's a call I never expected to receive. Now, could you give people a little bit of background? So from a dairy farm in Madison to auxiliary bishop in Chicago, a little bit of your history for folks to understand? It, it, it's proof positive that God draws <laughs> straight with crooked lines. But now, Jeff, the big you. question is, are you a Packer fan? <laughs> That's very pivotal. <laughs> That's a very dangerous question to answer in bear country. Yeah. <laughs> I wear I wear my green and gold underneath my elb. Okay, <laughs> at, at, at least you're being honest. I'm right now. We're live streaming, and I'm wearing my Chicago Bears mask. I know the Packers play tonight, <laughs> but I know anybody from Wisconsin. You know, it's in your DNA. You're automatically a Packer fan. It's Pretty part of much. who you are. Pretty much, um, although I grew up in a small town just west of Madison, and so we spend a lot more time going to Camp Randall for uh, Badger football games. Uh, not True. that we don't respect and honor the the Packers, but just because it, we had you know close proximity and accessibility, and we would often go to Badger games. So tell us about your journey. You know, your boy raised in Wisconsin. What happened? Uh, yeah, I mean, just. Uh, God, you know, called me, I believe, uh, from early age, uh, as far as vocation to the priesthood, or at least what I believed I thought was a call. Uh, I went through high school seminary in Madison at Holy Name, um, started um, uh, college seminary, uh, studying for the Diocese of Madison, but then actually took some time out just to make sure that this was uh, what I believe I was called to. Which college seminary was that, Jeff? Uh, college seminary at that time was St. Meinrad, because okay, that's, sure. what, that's what um, the Diocese of Madison was using as its college uh, Indiana seminary. There. Yes. And, um, but then in the four years that I, I took out to work, I lived and worked in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and so I spent a lot of time back and forth in Chicago coming down for just different events, sports, different, you know, theater, whatever. And, uh, you know, kind of, and I kind of I fell in love very much. I don't know if it's that old image of, you know, small town boy meets big city kind of thing. <laughs> and, um, but then when I, I returned to studies um, and uh, finished seminary college and started theology, uh, still for the Diocese of Madison, but there was just something pulling at my heart to come to Chicago. And so after my first year of theology, which I was attending at St. John's in Collegeville, Minnesota, um, I made the the shift um, applied and approached the Archdiocese of Chicago and um, transferred uh, to continue my studies and finish my studies here. At, what at year was that, line. Jeff? That would have been 1990, 1998, so you, uh, 1989. So you 1989. began the Theologate in Collegeville, but after one year, that inner urge about coming to Chicago, you applied to St. Mary the Lake Mundelein Seminary, and then you transferred over. And those yeah. are those are some crooked lines. Uh, one oh, of the yeah. crooked lines, you you've been in parish ministry, say, at Faith Hope and Saint Celestine's. Have you heard from any of the folks from the parish uh, since you've it, been named bishop? It, it, it's it's overwhelming the the kindness of people. You know, I mean, it's proof positive. You hope that. You, you, you try to make an, imp uh, impression, an impression in people's lives. You try to help folks. And, and you know, oftentimes we're veiled from seeing that. Um, but in moments like this, the, the goodness, the, the, the support, the outreach of people is, is truly overwhelming. Have you gotten an assignment yet as bishop what vic vicariate you'll be uh, in charge yeah. of? Yes. 
I'm Mark. Um, I'll be continuing here at downtown as judicial vicar until ordination on, on November 13th. And then I will be uh, assigned um, as uh, Episcopal Vicar for Vicariate 1. So I'll be up in, in Lake County. So oh, I, I thought okay. it was, and I Jeff, thought your it was residency will be where then? Uh, at this point, we're still working out those details. Um, uh, just because uh, the office, actual offices and the residents are not in the same place. So we've got some some uh, details to work out at this point. So you're heading back up north then, yeah. to back to the border almost. Well, that's, I mean, I think it's appropriate. They put the farm boy up in probably the most <laughs> rural part of the diocese. So that's good, a very wise call. Actually, it's uh, funny. Uh, one of the women, I was at Mundelein for 15 years. I worked up there, and one, sure. of, the, one of the women that w- ran the events was, ran the, her family ran the last dairy farm up oh my in, God. That, in that area, Mary Lou Diebold, and uh, God rest her soul, she passed. In Lake County, right? Yeah. In fact, mm-hmm. uh, when I was first there, I got a call that, Mark, I'm, uh, on my voicemail, Mark, I'm going to be late. We're birthing a calf this morning. It's not going <laughs> well. That's not your typical response of an employee. We're, we're, yeah. birthing, we're, we're birthing a calf. And exactly. Now, the thing is, as Mark had asked before, Jeff, and that is, uh, I know you've been overwhelmed by the goodness of people with emails and text messages and mm-hmm. phone calls and notes. Mm-hmm. And is the feeling with you right now is it's still kind of surreal as your whole life has changed so suddenly? Yeah, uh, Absolutely. Greg, Father Greg, um, you know, it's, you still kind of wake up, you know, at different points or you're about to do something and, you know, just the planning of all of this because, you know, very much the rest of life, the, you know, my other assignments, they all continue and so trying to be dutiful and, and faithful and responsible to them, um, but then also this whole other layer is, is developing um, and so it's, it is at times, it is, it makes you tend to be a bit pensive and, uh, um, just, you know, it's hoping for me, it's hoping that I'll, I'll be able to serve well. Uh, a, question, a, a question just hit me right now. You found out from the, um, from the archbishop on September 6th, what advice have you received from different people? at this point, after one month? Mm. Yeah, I mean, certainly the sense of uh, remain who you are. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in the sense, be, be true to yourself, be consistent. Um, uh, also, the, the, oftentimes, words surrounding being a, a good shepherd, a good pastor. Um, you know, always, you know, the, the, well, in so many ways, what might be words of, of our Holy Father, in a sense, to, to be with your people. Uh, to know your people, um, and so very, very, if you will, earthy, very, in so many ways, what should be common sense advice, uh, just to, you know, to tend to, you know, the, re- the responsibilities given, but with a very human face, uh, a very loving and, and caring face. Just continue to be who you are in a very humble way. Yeah. And it's very interesting, because when your name was um, announced when Kevin's name and Father Lombardo's name, I think there was a sense of joy in this archdiocese. Absolutely, that each, each oh, of you yeah. gentlemen just get it already. You get it as. And then Mark, you know, I'll say this in front of Jeff. They are so different, but they are great priests. So when all three were named in the house I live in the cathedral, you know, all ten of us were elated and thought, "What tremendous choices!" Yes, for you, exactly. for Kevin and Bob. And that uh, it, you know, talk about a starting all-star lineup. And Jeff, you have been so excellent as a priest in the archdiocese. You're always so kind with people. You follow through. You take time. Great listener. You're faith-filled. You know, you, here's the thing: you love the people of God and you love priesthood. That's very evident in all the years I've known you. Can I ask, how, what was your mom's reaction when you finally were Oh, yeah, when mom her? found out. Uh, uh, well, I've, I've had a, a, a string tied to her foot uh, ever since <laughs> uh, for fear of, for fear of, of floating off. away. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think it's three, uh, three images. First, that of you know, just a very, mom is very proud. She's very happy. She's elated. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also a sadness um, that my father is in here to, yes, to yes. see this because uh, my father died young. 
Um, but third, too, uh, her own share of angst and, and concern and trepidation about the role. Mm-hmm. Um, she's, uh, you know, I think you, you never stop being a parent. She doesn't stop being mm-hmm. a mom. And so she's concerned for her child. No, uh, that's a great response. What year did your uh, dad pass away, Jeff? Uh, dad died in 1995. How old was your father? He was what, 57. Uh, oh, he died, he wow. died in a plane crash. So it oh, was, did he really? It was a very, to hear that. Yeah, it was a very sudden and unexpected thing. He no died doubt. at a very young age. Yeah. Which was yeah. when your dad died, you said this was 1997, you said? 95. 95. Uh, and you were ordained in what year? I was ordained in 92. So I was three years a three priest. Three years a priest. God, you yep. are, and when you were newly ordained, you were assigned where? My first assignment was Faith Hope, Saints Faith Hope and Charity up in Winnetka. For how many years? I was there for six years. Followed and by... then was asked to go off to do doctoral studies uh, in canon law. C- can I ask, this is a question probably... Go right ahead, Mark. It probably makes no sense at all, but I've always wondered. So it says you're appointed titular bishop of Abora. First of all, where is Abora? And secondly, what does that mean? That you're, I'm sure most lay folks don't understand what that means, mm-hmm. other than do you run that parish too? Well, um, as best I have been able to research, Abora, I believe, exists somewhere in Tunisia. Oh. Um, at least that's, in, I mean, there have been multiple leads. I've been trying to, to find the exact uh, location myself. I thought but, it was outside of Detroit. Uh, <laughs> these are. <laughs> <laughs> but every every bishop is is assigned or has you know care and pastoral care of of a diocese, um, and so for the archdiocese of Chicago, our principal shepherd is, is Cardinal Supic. Right uh, now, when you come along with auxiliary bishops, they can't also be the bishop of that diocese. They're appointed auxiliary. Um, and so they must have every bishop in, in normally is in, in, whenever a bishop is ordained, he is assigned to a diocese, or he must be assigned attached oh, to a, a particular no, church. Okay. Um, so when auxiliaries are named, they are attached to uh, are assigned to dioceses in reality that no longer exist currently they existed once in time they existed historically at oh. least as i understand the mm-hmm. history of titular sees and um so that i am the titular bishop of abora uh, and auxiliary bishop of chicago um and so uh, because you see these you know in in many many dioceses there are auxiliary bishops well the reality is there can only be one Right, a uh, principal bishop, diocesan bishop. So you're uh, not I, taking any trip to Abora in the near no, future. No, but uh, but I mean, but I'm fascinated. Just uh, even if you know to learn to history learn uh, historically, <laughs> to where, find at least where it's located. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know, exactly. We need so to bring I, a segment I still to a have close. To do. Exactly. And I want to thank in a very special way, Father Jeff Grob, the new bishop elect for the Archive of Chicago, which will happen on November 13th, Friday at Holy Name Cathedral. And our phone number, 312-255-8408. Father Jeff Grab, God bless you. It's been a joy yes. having you on the radio. Know our prayers are with you and our support. And you'll be a marvelous new auxiliary in Chicago. So we're listening to WNDZ, 750 AM, Catholic Chicago. Father Greg Sakowitz and Mark Therese, we are live streaming, and we are both socially distanced. So this is History made, Being Made Today. Stay with us, and do not touch that dial. Hi, this is Bob Gilligan, Executive Director of the Catholic Conference of Illinois and current board chair of Aid for Women. I'm inviting you to a special event, a virtual fundraiser on October 7th at 7 p.m. This year's speaker will be Ben Watson, former NFL football player and Super Bowl champion. He's also the executive producer of a recently released film, Divided Hearts of America, a film that he hopes will change the nature of the debate about abortion in America. In addition, this year, we're honored to be presenting an award to Virginia McCaskey, owner of the Chicago Bears. For more information, go to www.chicago.org.
www.aidforwomenlive.com. That's www.aidforwomenlive.com. When you think of the word neighbor, warm and friendly thoughts come to mind. Think of smiles across the yard, positive wishes, and looking out for one another on an ongoing basis. Catholic Charities Neighbors in Need Fund inspires all of these and much more. We've seen an unprecedented number of requests for assistance this year from people who have never needed help before. When you make your gift to the Neighbors in Need Fund, you are igniting hope in the lives of your most vulnerable neighbors, especially individuals and families who continue to struggle to put food on the table and keep a roof over their heads. Your gift will give them the resources they need to overcome the unexpected, very serious circumstances in which they find themselves now. Give online at catholiccharities.net or call 312-948-6087. That's 312-948-6087. Catholic Charities Neighbors in Need Fund. Thank you for helping build a world of kindness, one neighbor to another. You're invited to Keep Hope Alive 2020, the online benefit and celebration of the Archdiocese of Chicago's Immigration Ministry and their nationwide program, Pastoral Migratoria. Join us virtually on the evening of Thursday, October 29th for a night filled with music, camaraderie, and inspiring speakers. Cardinal Blaise Supich and Sister Norma Pimentel of Catholic Charities of the Rio Grande Valley, who was recently recognized as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, will be joining us to help keep hope alive. Now, more than ever, the immigrant community, both here in the Archdiocese of Chicago and across the United States, needs the leadership formation and accompaniment that Pastoral Migratoria provides. Registration is free, and sponsorship and advertising opportunities are available. Visit www.keephopealive2020.org for more information and to register. Again, that's www.keephopealive2020.org. Welcome back to Catholic Chicago on WNDZ, 750 AM, 312-255-8408 is our number. Father Greg Sakowitz and Mark Teresi, and we are making history today. We are live streaming on our YouTube, and so you can flip to YouTube and watch us live stream. Again, 312-255-8408. Mark, we forgot to talk about my mask in terms of the Chicago Bears. Um, not good yesterday. No, it there, there was really no excitement to the game, for, at least the, on the Bears' side. I only side. saw the first half, and uh, Indianapolis has a great defense, and you can't blame Nick Foles. They have no running game yesterday. Right. It forces them to pass, and we become one-dimensional. They're waiting for it. So, again, but they play now this Thursday. Tom Brady comes to town, no longer with New England. He's with Tampa Bay. Right. So it should be, it'd be National Football League, uh, uh, national TV on Thursday evening. You didn't bring up the Cubs and the Sox. Either. Oh, gosh. Well, they both made postseason. God bless them. Right. Better luck next year. Right. It, exactly. it was a fun summer, and uh, the eight teams that are left are good. But we have now we have the second new bishop-elect, the Archdiocese, Father Bob Lombardo. Bob, congratulations, and welcome to the program. How are you, Father Bob Lombardo and bishop-elect? Very good, thank you. It's great to be with you this morning. How are you guys doing? Good, We're doing very, very good. Very congratulations. Well. Yeah, congratulations, Bob. Good. And well, uh, wonderful yeah, news you. for the Archdiocese. Now, we just finished speaking with uh, Father Jeff Grob, and after we finish with you, we have Father Kevin Birmingham. And the first question I'm asking all three of you, well, first of all, you've been an outstanding priest here in Chicago. We're going to get to your story shortly. But where were you and what time was it when you got the phone call? Well, interestingly enough, the call came in at 6 o'clock in the morning, oh. and it was on Sunday, <coughs> no, um, September 6th? 6th of September. I was now that's actually, exactly what uh, Jeff said, 6 o'clock in the morning, so this must have been a short phone call. It wasn't a conference call. Was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was actually on my hands and knees scrubbing the bathroom floor. <laughs> I didn't finish cleaning the bathroom on Saturday, and I had gotten up early on Sunday and, uh, you know, I had my coffee and everything and 
had my homily pretty much ready to go, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we still had a lot of time before prayers and mass here at the mission. So I said, let me finish the floor and just get it done. So the phone rang, and uh, I said, who in the world could be calling at 6 o'clock on a Sunday morning? And I found out who it was calling at 6 o'clock on a Sunday morning. So you want to talk about a total shock. And the thing is, what were his words to you? Well, he basically said, uh, you know, good morning, is this Father Lombardo? And I said, uh, yes, it is. I thought, who in the world? Because he had had a a thick accent. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said his name, but I couldn't really catch it. The connection wasn't that good. (laughs) He said that he was calling from Paris. So I said, well, I think, I think you might have the wrong number. <laughs> and he said, well, no, I, are you Father Lombardo? I said, yes, I am. And, uh, and then he said, well, are you alone? And I was like, yeah, of course, on 6 o'clock in the morning. What am I going to do? I'm alone. And, uh, and then he said, you have, uh, I have a message for you from the Holy Father. So I thought, hmm. And then I started saying, is this a, like a a, you know, somebody pulling my leg, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and then I realized that he was not pulling my leg, and he told me what the Holy Father wanted me to know, and uh, he said, you have been appointed an auxiliary bishop in the Archdiocese of Chicago. What and, was uh, the first thing went through your mind? The first, uh, I, I don't think anything went through my mind. It was just blank. And mm. uh, actually, the, the nuncio said to me, hello, are you still there? I said, <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I, said I am. He said, are you okay? I said, I just, I just don't. I don't, I don't, I'm not really able to speak right now. Yeah. So, I mean, I felt like a jerk because, uh, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't even talk. You're overwhelmed. As well, like, yeah. you well, it, was just, it was just such a, I, you know, at 6 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, I just, I mean, not that any time of the day or any day of the week I would have been expecting a call like that. But it just it just caught me so off guard, and I was like, you know. Did you ever, so, did that, you ever think during that conversation you thought it was a prank and someone's putting you up to it? Did, the, did you ever think about hanging up? You know, I wasn't even that awake at the, not awake, because I had, I had already had coffee at 515, so I, you know, I was awake, and I was cleaning the floor, so I was able to function. Um, but it just, it just, I don't know, it just happened so quickly, it was, I don't know, and it was, but it, you know, the thing was, he knew my name, so I thought, well, whoever it is, knew my name. Yeah, that's true. It's, so, it's interesting, too, because your selection just reinforced, for me... Um, the Pope's idea of who we are as church. I mean, Field been, hospital. you have been serving the poor probably most of your ministry. Um, and uh, how did the religious... Now, I know you had to be quiet for a while, but when it was public, how did your religious women in your order re- react to this? Well, it was really... <laughs> this was sort of comical, too, because it was announced at noon in Rome on the following Friday, mm-hmm. which is 5 o'clock in the morning here. So when it hit 5 o'clock, I knew, because I was told you know, ahead of time, that it's going to be announced at 5 o'clock Chicago time, and then at 5.15, press releases were going out. Mm-hmm. So I had 15 minutes. So I typed a quick text to the sisters uh, who were across the street in the convent, and uh, I, I, I figured that some of them were, usually they're up early to, you know, to pray and whatever, like we all are. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I just sent a quick text over saying, you know, I just wanted you to hear it from me that there was just an announcement in Rome that we have three new auxiliary bishops, and one of them is me. <laughs> so the first text I got back was, you're joking at 5 o'clock in the morning, ha-ha. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so I was like, I'm not joking, ha-ha. <laughs> texted right back, and, and then one of the others said, you are kidding. And I was like, no, I'm not. And then the press release came out at 5.15, and they were like, he's not he's kidding. He's not kidding. <laughs> he's like, well, the thing is that when, you so were, said, when the, when the yeah. uh, papal news gave you a call on Sunday morning at 6 a.m., you were under absolute confidentiality not to tell anyone correct then that, that had yeah. to be hard bob yeah that was really difficult uh because you know you're walking around all week so, sort of in a daze you know i'm thinking holy cow like you know like when i think of a bishop and i look at my history and my life it's like i don't have the pedigree you know i don't have a doctorate i don't have the degrees i don't have 
the, the experience and things like that. And then I thought, you know, Pope Francis thinks outside the box. He sure so, does. He does. He does. Yeah. And so, you know, he went far outside the box when. Uh, <laughs> 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 but as, as I was mentioning to uh, Father Jeff Grab, is with your selection, you know, be, being elevated to a bishop along with uh, Kevin Birmingham and Jeff Grab, three tremendous choices and all so different. And maybe for just a few minutes, I mean, Bob, your work at the mission, at Lady of the Angels, has been legendary. And maybe just for a few minutes, tell us how you ended up coming to Chicago, because you are not Chicago-born. You're not a priest of the Archdiocese of Chicago in terms of ordained at Mundelein Seminary. So kind of give us your background story. Yeah, sure, very quickly. Um, after college, with my degree in accounting at Notre Dame, I had worked for Price Waterhouse for a bit. And uh, then I joined the Capuchin Franciscans. A group of us started the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal back in New York. And so I had spent the bulk of my life working with the homeless mentally ill in New York, uh, as well as doing some missionary work, Olivia Honduras. So I had done that type of work with the poor. And back in the late 90s, when Chicago had gone through another wave of either closing or combining of parishes and, and schools. And Cardinal George was very concerned that parts of Chicago would be left without a Catholic presence. In our branch of the Franciscans, we actually live and work in neighborhoods noted for poverty, doing work to take care of the needs of the people, whether it's food pantry, soup kitchen, uh, after-school programs for our kids who are in danger of dropping out of school, all that type of stuff. So he contacted our community. I happened to have been in leadership at the time. And so I, I came out here, and that's how I met Cardinal George. And uh, then when my turn was up, even though our community had made a decision to go to areas where there's more of a shortage of clergy and religious, and Chicago didn't fit that demographic. So, but the Cardinal you know, pursued, he said, well, you know, would you be able to come out? And at first I was like, you know, I'm not coming out there by myself. We live in community. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, after, you know, numerous discussions, et cetera, um, you know, my community said, well, you know, a Cardinal is asking, so, you know, if you could do it for a little bit. So I thought, well, I'll come out for like a year or two, get something going, and then, you know, go to the next step in life, whatever that is. And this, you and, did come out by yourself. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so then the work began here. Um, you know, there had been a little food pantry on the site of Our Lady of the Angels that was run out of, uh, run by people from St. Francis, the neighboring parish. And then things just started to take off and the mission started to grow. And then young people were interested in having more of a commitment to the mission. So the Franciscan community began here. So there's 11 of us right now living here. We're taking care of just about 3,000 families a month now during the pandemic with a full week's worth of groceries because so many of our people are either out of work or unemployed or severely underemployed. You know, hours have been cut. Now, I think people need to know, Bob, that uh, you moved into the site. See, I'm, see, I'm Chicago born, so is Mark. And anybody old enough to remember December 1, 1958, the horrific school fire at Our Lady of the Angels is so etched in my mind. I was five years old. I remember that as if it happened two or three years ago. So this is the, now this is the folks of the area we are talking about that uh, Father Bob has moved, moved into. And um, now when you moved into that particular community, was the church officially closed and you reopened it? What was the status at the time? Yeah, actually, everything here had been closed down, the school as well as the parish. The parish closed first, and the school was kept open. They were trying to keep the school open because, as you said, you know, with the fire, the memories here, mm -hmm. the school was rebuilt, and, uh, you know, those, those details. It was, it's a tragic, tragic history. Mm -hmm. But as we know from our faith, you know, death, resurrection is, is a key part of, of our Christian faith. And so... You know, any time that there's a death, new life can follow. And so the way that I look at it is now there, there's new life here. We're a Catholic presence, though not a parish. So the school, as well as the parish, 
were were shut down. Actually, some of the buildings were rented out to a Baptist congregation when I got here. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's that's a little bit of the history here. But like you say, everywhere I go in the Chicago metropolitan area, you mention Our Lady of the Angels, and people are like, whoa, the fire. And even younger people, actually, because they all learn about it in school. Oh, yes. Yeah. Now, th- you also started the Franciscans of the Eucharist Order. H- how, how did that happen? Well, what happened was, so there were young people that were volunteering, and that's one of the things that I find really hopeful about the mission here because a lot of young people whatever their connection is with the church there is a desire to take care of people in need Mm -hmm. and so that's a way to build a bridge with the younger people as i see it or at least that's been my experience here so younger people were coming and volunteering and then you know little by little a few of them were saying you know gee i think i may have a vocation whatever so I said, well, you know, we could sit and chat a little bit. And there was a little group of them. So I said, well, you know what? Why don't we do this? Why don't we try to meet um, one Friday a month, like after work, come over, we'll have dinner, we'll have prayers, and then a little discussion. And I had people come from other communities to meet them. I sent them out to other communities. And they really wanted to do something here. And they knew a little bit about me. So they said, well, you know, you started something in, you know, you were one of eight that started something in New York. You know, why don't you just start something here? And I thought, well, that's not really what I, it really didn't appeal to me to start something new. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but at any rate, um, I went to Cardinal George and I said, look, I have this group of young people. I said, they're, they're interested. You know, I explained the whole thing. They think they may have a location. I said, I'm willing to have them move in as like a little discernment house. Now, were these which, women which, and men or strictly women? Uh, both, women and okay. men. Yeah, and so, uh, so you know, we had a little community. They were still doing their outside work, but we would have morning prayer and mass and then evening prayer with a holy hour every day and then dinner. They had a chance to, to continue their discernment. And then after a number of months, they were like, no, we really believe that the Lord is calling us to do something here. So I went to the Cardinal again, and I said, you know, they really want to do something. I said, you know, I I don't know what the Lord really wants, because I don't have, you know, there's no, I've never had a burning bush experience in my (laughs) life. (laughs) So. Neither have I, Bob. (laughs) Well, that's good. So we're (laughs) very good. You know, there's a lot of people in our club. (laughs) But so anyway, that's that's how that all starts. I went to the cardinal, and he said, "Well, he said, let's let's give it a shot. There's only one way to find out. You know, you test the spirits. Great, and, and, you, the, you and the rest is history. It sure, is. Is. exactly. As I said, the rest is history. And you know, thankfully, you know, four of them now they have their masters in theology from the seminary, and their masters in teaching. So they're back in our Catholic schools teaching religion, which has been a tremendous blessing. Wonderful." Uh, so, so it's it's worked out it's worked out really well. But you know, you want to make God laugh. Tell me your plans. Exactly. Because, well, they were live wires. No, we, at, they were live wires at. Oh Mulan. yeah, those those sisters you have in the brothers oh, you have wow. are just tremendous <laughs> they had, people. They had that cafeteria buzzing. <laughs> yeah. The, now we need to bring the segment to a close. But again, uh, Father Bob, oh, yeah. you're going to be Good. the new auxiliary in what vicariate? Vicariate three, starting so November fourteenth. Uh, no, actually. Uh, my start date was September the 14th. Oh, okay, so it started a yeah. couple weeks ago. Yeah, because what happened was Bishop Casey was out here in this vicariate. He went to the vicar general's he's, office. He's down here the, with, with the vicar general. With, with the Bishop Cardinal. Hicks. Yeah, with Bishop Hicks going to Joliet. Exactly. So there was a vacancy here, so I, I stepped right in. So, Which is good, because I haven't really had a chance to like dwell too much on all of this you know, changeover and stuff, which is good, because you know what? I am who I am, mm-hmm. and I'll always be who I am. So That's why you were not to, elected, and yeah. we want to bring it to a close. We want to thank in a very special way yeah. Father Bob Lombardo, Bishop-elect on November 13th, will be Bishop Robert Lombardo. Bob, thank you for joining us. Our prayers and support are with you. God bless you. I'll see you here on November 13th at the Cathedral for the big celebration, if not sooner. Our phone number, 312-255-8408, WNDZ. 7.50 a.m. on Catholic Chicago. Father Greg Sack with Mark Teresi. We are live streaming for the first time. History is being made. We are social distancing, masks included. Call us, 312-255-8408. Stay with us. 
And again, do not touch that dial. Hi, this is Bob Gilligan, Executive Director of the Catholic Conference of Illinois and current board chair of Aid for Women. I'm inviting you to a special event, a virtual fundraiser on October 7th at 7 p.m. This year's speaker will be Ben Watson, former NFL football player and Super Bowl champion. He's also the executive producer of a recently released film, Divided Hearts of America, a film that he hopes will change the nature of the debate about abortion in America. In addition, this year, we're honored to be presenting an award to Virginia McCaskey, owner of the Chicago Bears. For more information, go to www.aidforwomenlive.com. That's www.aidforwomenlive.com. Catholic Charities Divine Affair home tasting parties are going virtual. This year marks the 20th anniversary of Divine Affair, the elegant wine tasting event that benefits our self-sufficiency programs. Low income single parents with dependent children are trying to break the cycle of welfare and poverty. Today, the need is greater than ever as the COVID-19 pandemic has left thousands of newly struggling families in need of immediate assistance. You can easily coordinate a virtual wine tasting and help Catholic charities at the same time, same time, same time, same time, same time, same time, same time. Each guest will enjoy a sample wine, full wine kit that includes wine and a guide, all courtesy of Lewis Glenn's Wines. You can gather your friends and family for this fun event or incorporate a celebration for a birthday, anniversary, or engagement at the same time. To learn more about a virtual home tasting party and how you and your guests can win fabulous raffle prizes, call today at 773-756-6937. That's 773-756-6937. Cheers! You're invited to Keep Hope Alive 2020, the online benefit and celebration of the Archdiocese of Chicago's Immigration Ministry and their nationwide program, Pastoral Migratoria. Join us virtually on the evening of Thursday, October 29th for a night filled with music, camaraderie, and inspiring speakers. Cardinal Blaise Supich and Sister Norma Pimentel of Catholic Charities of the Rio Grande Valley, who was recently recognized as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, will be joining us to help keep hope alive. Now, more than ever, the immigrant community, both here in the Archdiocese of Chicago and across the United States, needs the leadership formation and accompaniment that Pastoral Migratoria provides. Registration is free, and sponsorship and advertising opportunities are available. Visit www.keephopealive2020.org for more information and to register. Again, that's www.keephopealive2020.org. Welcome back to Catholic Chicago and WNDZ, 7.50 a.m., 312-255-8408. Father Greg Sackowitz and Mark Teresi, thank you for joining us here again on Catholic Chicago. And we now have round three of the new Bishop Elects for the Archdiocese of Chicago happening November 13th in the Cathedral. We've had Father Bob Lombardo, Father Jeff Grob, and now we have Bishop Elect Kevin Birmingham. Kevin how are you this morning? Congratulations. Congratulations. Thanks, Father Greg and Mark. It's great to be with you again. And for, I, before I forget, folks, two days from now, we sing. October 7th, we sing? No, I don't want to ruin, lose our listeners. <laughs> <yet>. <laughs> but Father Kevin Birmingham turns 49 on Wednesday. Am I correct, Kevin? That's right. The feast of our Lady of the Rose. I'll finally be a 49er. A but 40, not, uh, no allegiance to the football team, of course. No, please, nothing like that. Happy birthday. Early happy birthday, Kevin. And I Thanks know Kevin so well because we were together at Holy Name Cathedral. Um, Father Kevin Birmingham was the, were you, you can say what we would call the executive secretary for Cardinal Supich? The administrative secretary. Same thing, I think. I, all these fancy titles 
yeah, all these titles, and so we lived in. We were down the hall from each other. Maybe we and, could uh, flip. Maybe we could flip this, and Kevin, you could tell us stories about Greg. <laughs> I don't think we have enough time, Mark. <laughs> and, and Kevin was such a joy to live with. Uh, Kevin, all the guys in the house say hello to you. They knew you were on today, and uh, they send their very best. And you are missed. And but also, uh, Father Robert Fedick has, has stepped in, doing a very fine job. Uh, but now, question we're asking. We asked of Jeff and also of Bob. What was the date? Where were you? Who called and what happened? So I did listen to the two previous guests, and it uh, the same day, uh, that Sunday, all three of us received a call. Except I didn't get the call at six o'clock. I got the call at five fifty-eight. So the new <laughs> deal was the one who called, as, as you heard from Paris. He was mm-hmm. probably just getting ready to sit down for lunch and said, oh, I probably got to get this out of the way before I pour my first glass of wine. Who knows what he was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he said, uh, I have good news. The, uh, the the Holy Father is appointing you uh, uh, bis- uh, Auxiliary Bishop of Chicago. And I tell the Holy Father, yes. And I'm like, wait a minute. I didn't say yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pause there. And he, and he, and he followed up with a question, right? I tell the Holy Father, yes. Right? And so the, the image that came immediately to my mind was, uh, believe it or not, of all people, Bishop Ron Hicks, now now over in Joliet. Uh, I remember Ron uh, telling us and sharing with us many times about his days at Munline Seminary in the formation faculty. And Ron said, when the Church asks you to do something, you say yes. So in that 62-second conversation, the one image that pops to my mind is the image of Bishop Ron Hicks and his uh, challenge to us to be able to say yes when the Church asks you to do something. Now, had you met um, the papal nuncio? The you cardinal? know, with my with my work uh, with Cardinal Supic, our paths did cross several times, and certainly over, even over the phone, phone conversations, and and through email. So he's no stranger to me. So you uh, knew his voice immediately. Yeah, I know his voice right away. Yeah, which is most guys did not know his voice. In fact, uh, we've had other uh, priests on the phone from a couple of last years. They wanted to hang up. They thought it was a prank. Yeah, I had the benefit of knowing his voice, but I also had the benefit of just him calling, you know, in my former position with the, with the Cardinal, um, asking to speak with the Cardinal or looking for some information. So it's not uncommon for the news field to call my cell phone and, okay. and ask, for, ask for something. So... I was just thinking, okay, I'm up anyways. You know, he's up early. Uh, what is it that he needs from me now? Well, he needs something. So he needed me. What was the first <laughs> thing, and I asked uh, Bob and I asked Jeff, what was the first thing that went through your mind when you came to realize he's not asking for a favor, he's not asking for some information for Cardinal Supic, but would you be, except being a new auxiliary, what was the first thing went through your mind, Kevin? So again, the first the first person that came to my mind was Bishop Bishop Hicks, and he's he's telling us to say yes, he's encouraging us to say yes. Um, and then it was a numbness. I, I just really didn't know uh, really what was happening, and it and it didn't hit me really until the following Friday when it was announced. Um, I don't know if Father Greg or Marky were there, but on that on that uh, September 11th afternoon at 12 o'clock, we gathered at St. James. Uh, chapel at Quigley Castle Center, and we were saying goodbye to Bishop Hicks. Oh, uh, that's oh, right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Exact and, time and I was in public. A, yeah. And I was invited already because of my work uh, down the hall from him at the Quigley Pastoral Center to be a part of that, that goodbye liturgy of the word. And the three of us now were invited uh, at a different for different reasons. And so we walk out at the prayers ready to begin. And something surprised me. All of a sudden, we're getting ready to take our seats, and the people behind us, those in the, in the chapel, just started applauding hmm. for the three mm-hmm. of us. And that was a turning point for me, because I thought, this is real. It's the first time I think it actually hit me, uh, the, the, the full scope of what was being asked. But it was, for me, it wasn't so much about me as it was experiencing the joy, the real joy of the people the people of God, in this case, those, those sitting inside Quigley. Um, and because of their joy and their happiness, I all of a sudden really started feeling 
for the first time, I think, in you know that whole week, a real sense of peace and joy as well. Good. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and that's what we had said earlier in the program, that there is a sense of joy. All three of our new bishops are wonderful priests, good people first, wonderful Great priests. priests. Yeah. And uh, you were a pastor for many years. Um, have you gotten any um, calls or notes or anything from the folks that you were a pastor or you, that you served in parishes? That's the, that, that perhaps is the most surprising part to me because there, there are so many that have come uh, wishing, um, wishing me well and, and offering their prayers from different parishes. And some of them would say, we saw this coming. Mm-hmm. Which which blew me away because at my heart, I'm a pastor, and that's all I ever asked to be in the church to serve God's people yeah. in that way, and have that relationship. Um, but they said they saw something uh, in me, and even priests would would call. They said they saw something in me where they they they, they noticed I had the heart of 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 a shepherd, mm-hmm. and and that's what our church. Uh, that's really what our church needs right now. You know, Kevin, you and I talked many times when we were together at the cathedral during breakfast, lunch, or dinner, whatever it be. No, not dinner, because you, you, know, you don't eat dinner, you eat breakfast and lunch, I can, that's why you're so thin. And all you kept <laughs> saying to me was, when your time ended serving with Cardinal Supich, you're going to go back and be a pastor. You said that to me a thousand times. So your time ended with Cardinal Supich, instead of being a pastor... You were named to the ministry, I think it's called the, the, the Diversity. Um, yeah, the, the Department of Parish Vitality. Of Vit- Vitality. The, Center. Right. the Pastoral Center. And I thought to myself, we, you and I talk saying, well, you're not a pastor yet, and you're going to give it one year, and then go back and be a pastor. And all of a sudden, the papal nuncio gives you a call. But now you will be pastor, but in a completely different way. And, and, and Kevin, among us brother priests, this was no surprise you're, you're a priest at heart, a bishop at heart, in terms of all you want to do is love people, serve people. We were elated about the selection for you. And you're by far the youngest. My gosh, you're only 48 to be 49 on Wednesday. We thought, no, you know. And also, people don't know this, when I, arri- when I was in Niles College Seminary on the faculty, I arrived in 1985. 03. <laughs> in 1903, exactly on the faculty. And then, Kevin, you gave me a call to enter the college seminary in Niles College. Was it 1988, roughly? Oh, it would have been 88, 89, that's right. And they gave me a call. But then when you were coming to Niles College, were you coming as a junior? So I, I uh, just finished, I graduated from Quigley South High School, and that was when you and I had our first conversations around Niles College. And to be honest, I was so convinced that that this was uh, this was the vocation God was calling me through mm-hmm. in my life, that it scared me, and so I, I ran away from it for a couple of years. So I went to Loyola University instead of to Niles College Seminary uh, for those for those two years, just to really discern and make sure it's, that this is part of God's plan, part of God's will, not not the will of a Kevin Birmingham. Um, and so, so you and I had those conversations, and it was probably hard for you at first to know that I wasn't going to come to the college seminary right away. But it was something that I think that I spiritually and just just emotionally uh, needed to do before uh, re-entering the college seminary um, as a junior, which is still part of Loyola University, of course. And I don't know if you remember this, Kevin. Who was the pastor that preceded you um, at maternity? That you... Uh, go, go on, Mark. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Who? What was his name? So, Father Tom Pelton. Oh, yeah, totally. yeah, and and I remember. I think it was was that his funeral that uh, you were pastor then, right? I was. Yeah, and, and I remember that, we were in I, the. I was on a I was on a, on a car driving down to uh, to New Orleans with my brother and my mother. We were going to take a cruise to the Caribbean, and uh, just north of Memphis, Tennessee, I get the call from the secretary that Father Tom had died, and I knew at that moment. The car had to go right to the airport, and I had to fly back. Mm-hmm. I needed to be a pastor to the people at that moment. So I did. I, I flew back and, and helped the, the community grieve and mourn and, and celebrate, really, his life. And actually, our conversation, you probably don't remember it, but our conversation was the nature of priests is you guys do wonderful work and ministry every day of your life. And when you hear about it, at your funeral. 
yeah. and I thought, what a wonderful moment for you earlier in your conversation to say, you're hearing what a wonderful priest you are now. You know, you don't have to wait till you're dead, dead yeah. to hear about it. Very good stuff. And, uh, yeah. and, and I thought, what about your classmates? What was their reaction? And so, in fact, this morning I was supposed to have breakfast with Bishop Alberto Rojas uh, of San Bernardino. Uh, today? Today. I was, <laughs> my vacation plans were, were to go to the West Coast for this week. I'm on vacation this week. In fact, I'm sitting out here um, at a fishing trip in western Illinois watching five deer uh, grazing in the prairie just across <laughs> the one city. Well, so you're not in but, Chicago this very minute right now, Kevin. No, that's why I asked to be put on last because I, I knew this the, the time difference. I would need I would need certainly a lot more coffee, uh, West Coast time. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but no, because of the the travel restrictions to some states um, as hotspots for Chicago, I had to cancel those plans um, because I didn't want to have to come back and self quarantine for for, for fourteen two weeks days as mm-hmm. we prepare for the ordination. So oh, that's interesting. And even if I just go back, we were talking earlier. It's now coming back to me when you were Quigley. You know, I talked about Niles College, and you still want to take some time off. I'm now recalling saying to you, Kevin, you are always welcome back here at the college seminary because you had this fear that if I don't start as a freshman, I'll never be accepted back as a sophomore, junior, senior. And I said, no, no, you know, discern and pray, and we were in contact. But it's funny, that conversation from over 30 years ago is now coming back to me. Now, I remember that conversation. It's true. You were always very gracious, very kind. And you always had the door open, which is still what you do as a pastor. Yeah, you, you, you leave do the door open for people to enter and to enter into that relationship, which is which is so powerful, uh, a staple of your ministry, Father Greg. You all, and, then, and Kevin, you're such a joy to have lived. You are so missed at the cathedral. But now, do we only have about a minute left, Kevin? That is, uh, upon your being named a bishop, and with November thirteenth, the actual celebration. Are you going to be put in charge of a vicariate, or what's going to be your ministry moving forward? So it appears that uh, I'll stay in my current role as the director of the Department of Spirit, Vitality, and Mission uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, and then we just wait and see what happens then after that. And residents where? Uh, currently I'm at uh, Our Lady of the Holy Family, the uh, Notre Dame site, mm-hmm. uh, in the Little, Little Italy area. And uh, I plan on staying there for now until until um, the assignment changes. The assignment changes. And who knows? Again, who knows when that will happen? Well, this has been just a joy talking to you. Do you have any big um, plans as you become bishop? To do, will you be visiting parishes also? Or, I mean, I can't see you not being involved in parish life. Kevin's a pastor at heart. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the challenge. I, I currently, I, for the last six years, uh, have helped at St. John Bertrand Parish in Logan Square. I mostly celebrate the Sunday Mass. I see that continuing, and it's a community I'm, I'm grounded in right now. It's oh, wonderful. To gather and pray. And, it, and it, it's, a, it's a life, spiritual life source for me right now. And I'm, I'm just grateful to Father Pat Marshall, uh, who's a pastor there now. Tell Pat I say hello. Continue mm-hmm. to allow me to, to, to be a presence to that community. That's you've always, great. You've always been very uh, humble gracious <clears throat> priest, Kevin, from day one, even from the seminary days, but we need to bring this to a close. I want to thank in a very special way Bishop-elect Kevin Birmingham, who celebrates his 49th birthday on Wednesday. Kevin, thank you for joining us. Our prayers and support are with you. You'll be a tremendous auxiliary. God bless you. I'll see you November 13th at the Cathedral, if not sooner. I want to thank in a very special way co-host Mark Teresi. Thanks for joining here today, oh, Mark. It was a joy. Again. What a joy. Great work of our producer, Vince Gerasoli, our great work of the engineer, Michael May. History was made today. We were live streaming. Who else is there? I can't see that. Oh, Javier Garcia. Javier and also Brian Brock. And so uh, thank you for joining us here today on Catholic Chicago. May God bless all of you. For this Thursday, Go Go Bears. Bears. Join us every Monday through Friday at this time for Catholic Chicago. You can stream our programs live or listen to past programs by visiting our website, archchicago.org, and clicking on Radio TV. And please connect with Catholic Chicago on social media.